that same video could be about I am Pradeep. I am staff at Digimon Khan in Chicago event and I was doing a survey of best speakers yesterday on June 20th and one of the best speaker was Robin who founded Dub organization. So, thank you. I did not pay him to say that, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would like to introduce our next guest. Ruben Dua is the founder of Dub and I am not going to read everything on the uh, books you've already got, but uh, Ruben's going to come up and talk to us about leveraging video for business growth, and it's something I'm passionate about as well. So Ruben, would you please come to the stage? Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, sir. You bet. <laughs> All right. How's everyone doing? So I just got off my flight just a little bit ago, red eye, so I'm a little bit exhausted. So if I pass out, just wake me up and I'll continue to talk. But I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I'm going to take you guys through some really interesting learnings and some, some stuff that I've kind of picked up along the way for leveraging video for business growth and really using video as a medium across all channels to grow your business. Um, whether you're a small business or a large business, a solopreneur, there's a lot of tactics, tactics, a lot of best practices that we can all start to use very easily to use videos. My company is Dub, Dub.com, uh, Dub with two Bs. Um, we are a video sharing and communication platform. So we allow users to create videos um, with our Chrome extension, with a mobile app, um, with our website, and then to share those and distribute those across email or social channels any number of ways. We also have a lot of integrations with HubSpot and Salesforce and all sorts of email systems. Um, and then we've got this powerful data tracking platform. So we can talk about that all a little bit later. Let's get into best practices now. Um, if you guys are on social, of course you are. Um, please consider checking my stuff out at Ruben Dua. So I'm on LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, even TikTok. Check it out. All right, so here's a little bit of an agenda. We're gonna talk about creation, production, commercials, distribution, and then data tracking. Why video? Okay, well this is serious. Um, we're all using video now. It's taken over our social channels. Facebook, Twitter, obviously YouTube. There's a reason why that's happening. It's because video works. When we watch video, certain neurons in our brain fire and we're able to make connections. What's interesting about this is that we've been visual as a species since the dawn of time. Whether it's cave paintings or hieroglyphics, we've always been, in, we've always been communicating in visual methods. Video, when it popped off a little bit over a decade ago, it opened up this amazing channel. And now, with bandwidth and with technology and, of course, cameras, it's very easy to leverage. So if you're not using video right now in your business, you're missing out. And that is not just from a marketing or from an advertising perspective, that's from a communication perspective. So whether it's explaining how your business works or whether it's you as an individual brand, as a spokesperson, if you're not using video, let's say on LinkedIn, you might be missing out. Now, a lot of people say, well, I'm a little bit shy and I don't really wanna put myself out there. We're gonna get into that. Creating your videos. So. I think about five, six, seven years ago, there was this big movement that happened where everyone said, I want to create a viral video. And there was a couple of great success stories. There was the Dollar Shave Club video, and there was the, you know, the Harmon Brother videos and the sandwich videos, like the, uh, the purple mattress one and maybe the squatty potty. And you guys all noticed these videos, and, and they were great. They were enchanting, and, and they won our hearts. And maybe they you know, took some, some bucks out of our wallet. But the reality is that that's not very easy to do. Um, it's not impossible, but that's a very calculated and a very expensive thing to do. I mean, all of those videos had big budgets behind them. Not to mention there was a lot of dollars that was spent pushing those on YouTube, on Facebook, and that was back in the era when cost per click or CPM rates were very low on social channels. That is not the case anymore. It's much more expensive. Within the last year, the cost per click prices on social media have gone up 10x. So if they were 20 cents before, you can do the math, they're now 
10x that. It's amazing, right? So two bucks now just for a click. Um, there's ways to kind of quote unquote game that where you can you know do CPMs and get more views. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a cost per click or a cost per acquisition, and it's not cheap. So what does that mean for us? Does that mean that we shouldn't try to get lucky, that we shouldn't try to create our next viral video? No, that's not what that means. What it means is that we need to get into a practice of making video a critical part of every aspect of our business. Um, every video exists as part of a funnel. There's a video, maybe it exists on Vimeo, maybe it exists on YouTube, maybe it's on your website, maybe it's on your blog, maybe it's on Dub, maybe it's on Wistia, maybe it's on Vidyard. There's a lot of great platforms out there. The point is though, is that that video needs to move your target audience and your prospects down some sort of a funnel. So a lot of people think, well, if I put my video out there, it's gonna drive branding, it's gonna you know, get people educated, it's gonna delight them, it's gonna teach them about my business, my product, my service, and that's great. And then they're gonna go and they're gonna convert. They're gonna self-convert. They're gonna go to your website, they're gonna go to your mobile app, they're gonna go to your booth, they're gonna go to your store, and they're gonna convert. That's not really the case. If we as marketers, if we as business people, if we as communicators don't provide a clear path for people to take when they watch a video from the beginning all the way to the end, we're missing out. So I always like to say, whether you're using email or social or SMA, whatever your channel is, the video is just the first step. It's the next steps, that's where the magic happens. So landing pages, they have to be hot. There needs to be a clear message, a clear hero message, a visual at top, a short video that's concise that people can actually consume, they can trust and then a call to action, a button that they can click to move them down the funnel. And that can be from an e-commerce perspective or to fill out a form or to just contact you via phone number. So whatever it is that you're doing for your video, make sure that you've set up a very clear and concise funnel because I promise you it'll make the ROI worth its while. Commercials are awesome. We should all have a commercial. Here's the thing. Gone are the days when you need to actually hire a full-on production crew with a makeup artist and a sound editor and a green screen and some crazy location and a Ferrari and a helicopter and the drone shot and the waterfall shot. Those things are, they're not really necessary. I mean, life is all around us. We have so many ways to share our stories, to capture where we are. I mean, our offices are pretty cool these days, right? Our homes are pretty cool. We have cute pets. You know, our backyards are cool. Um, you know, walking down the street in beautiful Chicago or Los Angeles or New York or even small town USA, that's something that's interesting that people want to see and to watch because seeing someone on video is kind of like going on a little mini vacation. You get to kind of experience their world. We don't need to see something out of this world to be enamored or to connect with a person or a brand. We just want to see something real, something authentic, something truthful. And that's what the power of video has. So when you're considering your next commercial, you can have the $50,000 budget or the $500,000 budget, or you can say, you know what? We're gonna do what some of the most powerful large and small brands are doing, which is to capture our personalities. Because guys, I gotta tell you, it's not the companies that are selling the products anymore. It's the people now. Every major brand is associating itself with a person. That's why the whole influencer thing took off. It's because these companies, these major corporations, lacked humanity. They lacked spokespeople. There was a lot of people working at these companies and big buildings that were making things happen, but they didn't have spokespeople to get out there, to share stories, and to build connections with people. So the influencer thing took off. Now, I don't know where it's at now. There's been some interesting press about you know, the crash of the influencer market. I'm not really sure about that. But what I do know is that people connect to people. So the next time you're thinking about your commercial, don't think about the helicopter shot, don't think about the water, waterfall shot, or don't even think about the celebrity that you wanna hire. Think about you and how you can share your story with those other personalities in your company because that is what people will connect to. Um, distribution is awesome. You know, It's one thing to create your video, it's the next thing to put your video out there. So what are the channels that we're gonna put our video on? That's a great question. Are we a Facebook company? Are we a YouTube company? Are we an Instagram company? What's our target audience? Why don't we start to think about who we're trying to cater to and who we're trying to communicate with? The reality is that all of these social channels here, 
they, there's no such thing as each one has its own age group anymore. I mean, maybe TikTok skews a little bit younger. I'm on TikTok, but you know, it's probably skews a little bit younger, but the reality is that Facebook has, maybe you could say it's uh, 20s and beyond, but I mean, I know my, my niece that I met with yesterday, she's 13, she's on Facebook. So the point of my story is that we need to think about being omnichannel. And that's a little bit of a jargon term that's being thrown around all over the place. So maybe I shouldn't use it. Maybe I should just say, we need to leverage all channels because there are existing ecosystems that we can tap into. And if we're smart about the mentions and the hashtags and the people that we connect with, all of these channels can be powerful. Let's just punch through a couple of these channels here. Facebook, the thing that's hot on Facebook right now is actually um, long videos, nine by 16 format or square videos. Let's all face it, our attention span on Facebook is extremely short. We only have a couple of seconds. 30, 60 second videos on Facebook, it's difficult to convert those. What we're seeing now is six to 15 second videos. Consider doing A-B tests of all those lengths and sizes because that's gonna be probably where your money comes in from an ROI perspective. Um, YouTube, YouTube is actually really promoting now engaging, recurring, stimulating content that's actually more longer form. 10 minute, I mean the videos that we produce for Dub, they're almost 10 minutes. We did a video, we, did, we actually did a video masterclass that we dropped yesterday on YouTube at Dub App and it was a 10 minute video. And it was me in my car and it was me at some cool place in, in Silicon Valley that was just kind of shooting random scenes and teaching video marketing. Um, YouTube likes long form content. Now that said, there needs to be some production value because if there isn't production value and you're just putting uh, a, a webcam shot or sort of a still shot that's long, it's difficult to actually grab people's connection. Unless, of course, you've got that personality. And that's where people can, can really engage. If you look at any of the, the big vloggers that have a million plus followers, if you go back and look at their stuff from uh, you know, three years ago or five years ago when they first started, it, sometimes it's 10 minute rants where they're just at the airport or in their basement or just on a curbside just sharing a story. So as long as there's a personality, as long as there's engaging, informational, delightful content, long form content is totally embraced on YouTube. Try it, it works. Instagram is amazing, it's unreal. There's no tar, I mean, everyone's on Instagram, right? Age three to 103 or 133. Um, the thing that is really popping off on Instagram right now is IGTV. So raise your hand if you're on IGTV or if you've ever published a video to IGTV. Okay, cool. So it, this is an early, early, early time for IGTV. It is a, it's a hot time to get into IGTV right now. It's like a gold rush, okay? They're going through some pivots, they're changing. At first, the, the format size was actually, you had, you had to have a video in nine by 16. And just very recently, within the last month, they made it so that you can put a, a 16 by nine video on IGTV. And the reason why IGTV is very relevant is because Instagram caps you at a 60 second limit on Instagram, they've done that since, since video was announced on Instagram. With IGTV, you can put longer form content, which means you can put full episodes, walk and talks, in informational videos, personality videos. That's the theme here. Twitter has video now, um, I think it caps you at um, a minute and 20 seconds if I'm not mistaken, or is it two minutes, I don't recall. Um, the cool thing about Twitter is that if you, if you have access to Twitter Studio, you can actually put longer form content on there. Now, I'm mentioning long form content a lot. I'm not saying that you should really focus on long form content unless you can focus on it. But Twitter is actually a good, good means for videos in general. Um, we actually use Twitter Promote, which is a $99 a month service. And it has an algorithm, which is a little bit of a black box, but it puts your videos out front and center um, on the relevant um, hashtags. So consider checking out Twitter Promote. The verdict is still not out. If you Google it, there's a lot of information that says, well, does it work, does it not work? I mean, our videos um, will get hundreds or thousands of views with, um, with our small audience and then with Twitter Promote. So consider checking that out. Um, LinkedIn is powerful for video. LinkedIn is probably the new, LinkedIn is the newest player with video, okay? And they've done a phenomenal job at it. So please raise your hand if you've put a video on your, on your personal LinkedIn page. Okay, cool, and then um, please raise your hand if you've done a video on your LinkedIn company page. Okay, cool, so I see a lot more adoption when it comes to the company page. The reality is that um, we're, 
Profile pages get 10x the engagement of a company page because it's people, right? I mean, we don't really follow companies. I mean, maybe we do just to kind of see what's going on if we want to see a product announcement, but I always want to know what people are up to. So one of the sort of tricks that I think people are doing now is that they're just assuming the role of the spokesperson for their company. And they're just documenting the things that they're already doing, whether it's team meetings or product announcements. I mean, for a lot of people, it's actually re replaced the press release. Now it's just a video. Um, the cool thing about LinkedIn is that if you do it right, you can get a lot of traction because LinkedIn is promoting video like crazy. Why are they doing that? Because they're getting ready to start selling video advertising. When Microsoft announces the video advertising thing on LinkedIn, it's gonna be crazy. People are gonna be spending a, a lot of money. Now, you can, you can advertise with video on LinkedIn right now, that is possible, but not like it is on Facebook and not like it is on YouTube. That is coming and when that happens, it's gonna be crazy. Um, it is a very good time to get into LinkedIn from a video perspective, okay? Just a couple of best practices, let's just knock these out. Number one is have a thumbnail graphic. Um, you can do it from your company, pump, company page, you cannot do that from your personal page. So from your company page, either throw something together um, in whatever programmer you use or just grab a still from your video and then upload that to the company page. From your personal page, you're gonna have to, basically the, the hack here is that the first frame of the video has to be the thumbnail graphic because that's kind of important. So figure out a way to, to make your first frame kind of pop in your video so that when people see it, it's not you closing your eyes or you know, your camera pointing at a carpet or something like that. Make sure it's interesting. Um, those videos do autoplay, but it still takes a couple of seconds, so that's important. Um, closed caption you know, SRT files. Please raise your hand if you're adding closed caption files to your video. Okay, so not so much adoption here. Guys, it's critical that you do this, okay? Why is it critical that we add captions to our videos? Please, please, someone answer that question. Searchable. What? It makes them searchable. That's awesome, that's an SEO thing. That's totally true. Right there, sound. The vast majority of the video that we're watching on the internet doesn't have the sound on. That's kind of an oxymoron. But it makes sense. I mean, do you guys remember like 10 years ago when you went to a website and there was that little figure on the bottom right of the site who just started talking and you're like, where is that coming from? And you have 10 tabs open. And you're like, stop it, make it stop. And you just close your whole browser. I, that caused a whole movement now. Chrome um, actively mutes all videos. Like on Dub, we have an autoplay option, but it only works about maybe 40% of the time because Chrome, the browser that most of us use, they actually block audio. So captions are critical. There's a couple of really easy ways to do it. Number one, on Facebook, if you upload a video, it will automatically generate an SRT file for you. Okay, so that's completely free. It's not perfect. It's algorithmic. You have to go in, you have to make edits, you have to make changes. But the cool thing is that within, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes, it'll auto produce that. And then depending on the length of your video, you can get in there, make your tweaks, download the file, and then upload that to LinkedIn. So that's something that we do every day on the videos that we publish. Every single day we go through that process. Um, uh, we, we use a service called rev.com, R-E-V.com, not sponsored by them, I'm just throwing them out there. Um, they have a human service where they actually go and listen to your video, you know, manually create the SRT file. It's kind of, kind of cool how they get it really right. Like if you have, like we have beatboxing in some of our videos and um, they'll actually write like beatboxing. YouTube, uh, you know, the YouTube algorithm will never figure that out. So it's kind of cool. They put little music notes. I'm a musician, so I kind of enjoy that. Um, but yeah, so LinkedIn, um, consider pushing on LinkedIn because right now it's, it's, it's the golden age, really. It's, it's an amazing time to get in on LinkedIn. Um, calls to action on all of these are critical. Always have a link. If you can, use a trackable link. Please, a show of hands, how many people are using UTM parameters in your URLs? All right, so I'd say moderate adoption for, U, for UTM parameters. You, if you don't know what that is, please Google it. It's a very simple practice that's been around for a number of years, and it's basically a parameter system where you can append your source, your medium, your campaign, your content, and then your term to the URL. So depending on what your CRM is or depending on what the tech that you have, when people sign up, when they fill out a form, when they convert, when they buy something on your website, even if they call you, there's tracking for that. You can actually know what the attribution was. You can say, hey, the six second video on Facebook on campaign XYZ actually drove this conversion. And that's hot because without that, you're not gonna get your data tracking. 
Making video is about being creative and it's about sharing stories, but it's also about really being smart. We're gonna get into that. Um, email is, is not dead. Email is hot. Email is still what we all use. We all have an email account. We all check it every single day. Um, yeah, it's probably slammed. I mean, I, at one point, I think I had 100,000 unread emails in one of my uh, accounts, which of course I deleted. But you know, we all know that story, right? How do you punch through the noise on email? We're gonna get to that in a second. Um, the point though is that email is a very good method to distribute videos. So you might be asking, well, how do you send a video on an email, that, that doesn't make any sense. Well, here's how, it's actually a really simple trick. What you do is that you create a three to six second animated GIF of your video. You can do, there's a lot of free sites, there's all sorts of really ugly, really crappy sites where you can do this. You upload your video, you slap your little YouTube link in there, um, you put you know, six images and it'll auto-produce an animated GIF. Giphy.com has that. Um, I think there's another one called Easy GIF, which we use sometimes. Um, and that will create a three to six second animated GIF. That GIF then is a little preview. It's a little, it's a little nugget. It's a little you know, honey for that, that you can place in your email so that when you broadcast that email, either on a one-to-one -one or a campaign basis, you give the person a, a taste, a teaser, a visual of what they're about to see. That's pretty cool. How many people are using animated GIFs in their email campaigns? Okay, cool, so that's countable on one hand, probably. Um, when we started to do that in our email campaigns, it was easily, easily a five to six X, six, um, X increase in our click rates, it, easily, because people are like, well, I kind of have to watch that. And then we went down this whole path where we added these personalization components where you can actually add the person's name um, to the thumbnail graphic, and that's where we saw a crazy increase. Um, but if you're not doing animated GIFs, which it sounds like you're not, please consider that, because it works. Um, video for sales. So um, I think that we all know that the era of the, you know, the alpha sales man guy, I want to be politically correct here, you know, that, that boiler room, that keep grinding, you know, that, that like leaderboard thing, those days are getting numbered. It's hard to do sales like what they used to do back in the good, good old days, you know. Now it's about providing value. It's about being a consultant, being a friend, you know? The reason why I think women are doing so well in sales right now is because maybe they approach this different from the male perspective. Now, I know I'm being a little bit sort of gender biased here, but screw it, I'll go for this, you know? I think we have to be nurturing. I think we have to be caring and really want to help the person and want to see them succeed, not say, oh, well, how, how am I gonna pay the next uh, lease payment on my, on my Lamborghini, you know? We really have to come at this from an educational perspective. Video allows us to do that. I think there's really two ways that I'll share that video can, can help you in your sales. So number one is simple webcam, simple phone videos that you send to people. We built our company based on being able to do that, right? It's a team-based platform. You know, individual people can send these videos out. They create them within seconds, direct integration into Gmail. Why did we do that? Why did we spend all this money to create this tech, to be able to send an email through LinkedIn and Gmail? The reason is because the problem is trust. Sales now, the first step of sales is about building trust. It's not even about providing value. It's not about what you offer, what you've done, what you, where you went to school, what your, what your value proposition is. Can I trust you as a human being? If I put my credit card on the line, if I put my reputation on the line, if I put my job on the line, are you gonna provide some value to me? You know? So, I mean, a, a lot of us are marketers, but we, you know, we're also salespeople because now it's, there's no such thing as sales and marketing. It's all smarketing now, you know? So, um, so video is really powerful when it comes to building trust. So, you know, grab that phone, grab that device, get some tech, get yourself set up. Dub has a free account if you want to grab one. If not, find another way, but just do it because it really works. Um, the other thing is screen videos, right? So people want to see proof, social proof, social validation. It's become a cliche. It's a term that we all use now as marketers, right? Showing and not telling. I mean, that's what Scorsese says in, in his filmmaking. That applies to us as marketers. It's about showing and not telling, right? Creating a screen video can do so many things. It can show someone how your product works. It can show you know, that you're on their website, that you're doing an, I don't know, an SEO analysis on their site. 
you know, I, I remember early on, we used to do screen videos in a, in a past life where we would go into the source code and we would say, hey, all your metadata is incorrect. It's not, you're not getting good SEO juice on this. You're not going to get good social shares. And when people saw that, you know, they just, they reacted. They said, wow, thank you so much. So, thank you so much for showing, you know, under the hood for my business. Now I can correct this. So it built a lot of trust for us. So I think these are two things that can start to help you as either salespeople or, you know, sales supporters or sales enablers, because frankly, we're all of that. It doesn't matter how big the company is. Um, this is an example of, of an animated GIF. It's terribly pixelated. That's, I mean, it's crazy. GIFs are like a 25-year-old, 30, almost 30-year-old 30 technology, and we still use them. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, we like emojis. Um, I don't know if people like emojis. Um, okay, so data tracking. Let's get into data. So um, how many of you guys consider yourself data-driven marketers? Just a show of hands, please. All right, I'd like to open up the mic just a little bit. Do we have that floater? Is that thing on? Um, just tap it. Okay, cool. So that guy's on. So, all right. So I want to hear what you, I'm a data geek. I, I just get so excited when it comes to data and I can share all my stories with data. I want to hear what you guys are doing for data tracking, for data reporting. So if we have some courageous ones, please, this is a really good opportunity to brand yourself. You know, people are going to see that you grab the mic. Um, anyone have courage? To, oh, boom. No, he's actually the staff. Okay, so I need, I need someone with courage right now to tell me what you're using for data, or I'm going to assume that there are no data-driven marketers here, or we're all shy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we use a, a handful of different, different tools Let's to, hear the stack. to track data. <laughs> So uh, we use UTMs, so that's kind of core one. We use UTMs both in Google Analytics to track traffic to our, our publication site and the rest of our web pages, but then we also use it integrated in Marketo, which is our marketing automation software. Nice. So we track on both, so we track uh, through UTMs on both of those. Uh, we also use a, another service, I don't know what it's called because I don't manage it, but it's able to, to pull in data on our, from our uh, CRM system, which is outside of Marketo, to engage what our audience looks like based on um, various things that are important to us. So we're a, an association in the banking industry. We work with you know, various levels and types of folks, and so we're able to track who's coming from what types of organizations, by size, by job function, by level. So we were able to target, okay, if we want to target bank marketers for a webinar that we have going on, we'll be able to reach out to those specific people by job type, by function. So that's kind of a, a brief of how we're able to, to use data to you know, some of it, so. Very cool, yeah, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of services out there where you, when you grab your data and your UTM data, it actually can aggregate more data from third-party services to provide more valuable information, how big the company is, you know, how much revenue there is, how many employees there are, so there's a lot of way to, like, enrich your data, so that's, that's very cool. Anyone else courageous to talk about data in a stack? Um, is, it, is it okay if I record this? Yeah, sure. Okay, cool. My name is Brina, B-R-Y-N-A. Uh, I'm a um, digital marketing analyst working for Visit Florida. So I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Visit Florida, which is the Florida State uh, Tourism Marketing Organization. So I'm probably, if I don't say the only one, probably the few of the uh, people in the a company actually knows a little bit about data. So a big part of my job is to try to embrace the data concept and convince my team that data, it is working. Actually, we, we need to know more about data and leverage um, the, the data's power to uh, better, how to say, improve our uh, performance and everything. Very cool. Great to hear. Yeah. Any other volunteers? Maybe the last one? Cool. How are we doing on time? I haven't seen any cards. Unlimited? All right. <laughs> okay, so, um, you know, 
activity reporting is, is also a really important thing. So, um, you know, I, I'm sort of an early HubSpot adopter. Uh, I went through their whole certification process years ago. And what I became enamored by was their user level data tracking. So we're all used to macro data tracking. You know, what is the email open rate? What is the email click rate? What is the video watch rate? What is the conversion rate? We're all used to that. We've seen that data a lot. With tech, with CRMs like Marketo, I should say marketing automation systems, and, and so many others, now we can get granular about user level data. And that becomes really interesting because if we can track people at either a campaign level or an individual level, we can increase the value of our prospects by 10 to 20 X. You know, if we know who is engaging on our site, on our landing pages, on our forms, you know, we can, we, can, we can make better decisions. And frankly, we can track the customer journey so that we can improve the overall experience. So if you're not using some sort of a user level tracking or customer journey tracking, this is something that you might consider getting into. Now, it's a little bit, it takes time. It takes a couple of months to kind of get into because you have to put certain tracking pixels. And, um, you know, it, the, there's no real privacy issues. I mean, unless maybe if you're in Europe, maybe there's some GDPR issues. But all the major platforms like HubSpot, Marketo, Eloqua, Agile CRM, you know, SharpSpring, all those guys use this type of tech. The thing that's really amazing about user level tracking is that you become a hero for your sales department, okay? I love, I've, it's always been something I've been very passionate about, but it's basically to go to a salesperson and say, I have some data that is going to help you and me to hit quotas and to drive more revenue. That's always been something I've been very, very passionate about. And if you can figure out ways either at, again, the campaign or the user level to provide this type of tracking where you know who the individual person was that came to the site who that person was that filled out the form or you know, made the phone call. If you can provide that information, all of a sudden you provide something to the salesperson which is called the, you know, the hot list, right? The hot, we all know about that, it's the hot list, it's the top 100 or top 1000 or whatever it is. So that level of data is really, really gonna help to drive revenue and frankly to make you be a hero because we're all about that. Um, this is just a graphic, uh, this is actually from the Dub platform that just shows um, the, the user level tracking. So what email they opened, what email they clicked, what video they watched, what percentage of the video, um, the call to action if it was clicked. So um, we got real deep into this. Um, here's a couple of key takeaways, okay? Um, produce consistent high quality content. Um, video is not about um, your 747 airplane. It's about your, your rocket ships. It's about your jets. It's about your balloons that you put out there. Get into a frequent process of doing this, both for yourself as an individual, because I promise you it'll help you in your career, but also from a company perspective. The only reason why I'm on this stage is because I threw a video out there somewhere. I don't remember which one it was, but someone saw some video where I was pretending to be cool and someone said, hey, I want you to come talk, and it worked out, right? So, you know, the power of video, there's this other sort of key takeaway. You know, when we watch a video of Oprah, we feel like we know her, okay? Oprah doesn't know us, okay? Maybe there's one person in here that knows Oprah, but I don't know Oprah. But when I see Oprah on a video, I feel like I know her, right? It's built, some, video has the power to actually create a relationship, which is kind of, kind of neat if you think about it, right? So when we are in this process of creating videos on all these channels that we mentioned, we're building connections. We're, we're building trust. You know, we're getting people to connect with us, which is, which is in my opinion, the key to video marketing, connections. Um, you know, go Omni, you know, get all the channels going. I mean, look, here's the deal. Whatever target audience you're catering to, that target audience is gonna expire soon. You know, that sounds kind of scary, but it's the truth. I mean, people get older and they stop buying crap, right? When you're older, like my parents, they don't buy that much stuff anymore. You know, maybe a couple of key things, but they're in their, their thing. I mean, my dad, it took him like eight years to get a new iPhone, right? But the younger generations, they're the ones that are going crazy. It's like this whole idea of, you know, having everything but owning nothing. So, you know, consider about broadening your, 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 your age groups and your demographics. I, I'm just going to throw that out there because we have, like I mentioned, someone that's going to be coming up on stage. 
Um, and then don't forget about the analytics, guys. Let's be data-driven, you know? We're all creative. This whole idea of being right-brained and left-brained, that's all garbage. If you, if you look at the new study on that, there's no, that's, that's all garbage. We're all dynamic people now that are constantly making decisions. You know, we're, we're making choices. We're able to you know, look at data, look at information, react to that, survive out there, and, and be who we are, right? So don't ever find yourself stuck into a rut where you're like, you know what, I'm too creative, I'm too much of a right brain thinker. That's all garbage. Now we're all empowered through simple platforms and simple charts that are colorful and cool. They use, col they use cool colors now. Um, but get into that, you know, lean into that discomfort because that is where you're gonna figure out the information that will help you to make better choices. And that all makes us look really good. And of course helps our businesses grow. Um, so just a, a sort of a final point here. Um, you know, I want to talk about fear. I'm going to just pivot the combo for a second here. I want to talk about fear, right? So we all suffer from this syndrome called fear. Every single one of us. It's encoded into our DNA, actually. And it's actually a survival tactic. The reason why we feel fear is to be able to protect ourselves. If we're out in the jungle and in the wild and we're, you know, attacked or threatened, fear will kick in and our reptilian will Will, brain will activate and we will make a choice. We'll either run, or we'll, we'll grab a web, we'll do whatever we need to do to survive, right? The reality is that every single one of us, we're, we're sort of limited by fear, right? And what I mean by that is that the choices that we're making, the risks that we want to take to go put that video out, to go put that LinkedIn video on the internet, to go you know, try a new um, you know, medium, a new channel, a new you know, crazy off the top concept for our commercial. We're limited by fear because when we make those risks, it puts our jobs on the line and it puts our reputation on the line. And I think that we are living in such an age where we can actually transcend from fear now because we can fail very fast. If you put a video out on the internet, you can pull that video off. This is not a TV spot from 10 years ago or 20 years ago where you just drop the 30 second spot that's going to the Super Bowl and you cannot change it. That is not the case anymore. It's literally pushing a button and it's dead and you pivot and you fail quick and then you move on to the next thing. Fear is actually limiting us from being able to take the risks that will help us to do our jobs. I believe that if we go to our bosses or if we go to our customers or if we go to our clients and we say, hey, listen, we want to take a little bit of a risk. We want to try something out. As long as we're data-driven, as long as we're proficient, as long as we're professional about it, clearly communicate what our goals are and what our path is and maybe some fallback options, we're going to get empowered. We're going to get embraced. And as long as we document the whole thing, you know, for everyone that's involved, for all stakeholders, even if we fail, we're going to look like heroes potentially. And the key though is to be data-driven, to figure out where the learning is, what the mistake was, and how to pivot into something that's actually going to work. Fear can be overcome now because fear now is a button that we can turn off. So that's something to think about. So, you know, there's, a, there's two topics that are really important here, okay? Number one is that, you know, our, our age groups, you know, I think just a quick, quick raise of hand here. How many people are catering to millennials or younger for their target audience? Okay, cool. So maybe 30%, maybe more, maybe 40%. So here's what's really interesting is that millennials are, they're actually driving this movement, okay? Because if you think about how they, how they operate, you know, they have their phone in their pocket always, well, just like us. But they hit record constantly, you know? They're snapping photos. They probably take 20 times more photos that we do, more videos. You know, that Snapchat, TikTok, you know, early Facebook, definitely Instagram culture, um, you know, Vine as well, those like six second boomerang clips, those things that you see all over. You know, that movement is really what catalyzed a lot of the video um, marketing movement, right? Because it's all about clicking a record and it's all about being authentic being honest, not having fear, putting yourself out there, and then once it's done, you move on to the next thing. Video is ephemeral in many ways. Yes, it can be evergreen. Yes, it can exist on our library, but at the same time, you put it out there and it goes, okay? Um, so any questions, guys? We talked a about a lot of things. Yeah. yeah. Let's grab the mic here. I'll, I'll come down there. Okay, cool. I'll still come down there.
Hi, can you talk about the value of a Facebook Live video relative to pre-recorded videos? And if closed captioning is important, how do you make that happen on a Facebook Live video? Yeah, so live video is, um, it's a big movement. Thank you for that question, that's really good. Um, I actually didn't talk about live video at all, um, which is probably remiss on my part. Um, so let's, let's get into it. All right, so live video is now available on, let's see, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. So I think everyone now has live video. So there isn't a video platform or a social network out there that does not have live video. Um, there's a reason for that, because live is the most authentic thing that we can share with someone, something that's happening right then and there. The reality with live video is that it's hard to get those live videos to, to be an evergreen asset. Okay, and what I mean by that is that when you throw a live video out there, it's probably something that's going to be event-based. Something is happening, it's an announcement, a ribbon is being cut, something is going on, right? So event-based videos are, are great for live videos, right? We completely, completely, uh, you know, believe in that model. The, the reality, though, and, and I will say this, is that all of these social networks algorithmically are promoting live videos so aggressively right now because everyone believes in it, Right? Um, if you put a, a Facebook Live video out there, you're going to get bumped to the top of the feed, and a lot of people are going to see you. You, you might have noticed that if you've done it, and then you'll get some likes, and people will join in, and then they'll drop out, right? Right now, though, the reality about live video is that we're all enamored with the idea of live video, but I don't know if it's fully, fully, fully taken off to the level that I think the big social networks have expected it to, right? It's hot, but it's not that hot, right? So I want to answer your question. Um, I think that, you know, captioning is, is, is really important. We talked about everything being on mute. A lot of the times, probably most of the times I'm watching a live video, I'll spend the first 15 to 20 seconds just seeing what's happening. You know, wherever the person is, I won't really read it. I'll kind of look at the comments. I'll look at the engagement and, and then I'll make my choice, right? Um, so I think the captions is really important. I think it's important to put it out there, but there's a lot of limitations because now you're doing real time closed captioning, which, you know, I don't know if you guys have seen this, but a lot of the times this, the computers mess it up and the words get all fumbled up, which kind of maybe it looks bad, right? So there's a lot of limitations with, with um, you know, Facebook Live. The, one of the things that we, we always say at Dub is that you sort of have to embrace the medium. Whatever the constraints are for that particular channel is what you need to be doing. There's no way you're going to get perfect closed captioning on, on, on live video. It's not, it's not going to happen, right? Um, there's no way that you're going to figure out a way so that everyone joins into the video right at the beginning. It's going to be a stream of information that people kind of slowly, slowly join, right? You need to figure out ways to live within this constraint. For example, when we do live videos, we'll, every 30 seconds, we'll, send up, we'll sort of remind people what we're doing. Hey guys, just a quick recap, we're doing X, Y, and Z, so that the new people that came in know what the heck is going on, right? Um, the other thing is that you know, that video is, it will live and it will go back to your social network, right? Wherever it is. And on most of them, you can't clip it. You can't cut it. Now on YouTube, they have trimming options, but a lot of the other ones, you can't like trim that once you've recorded it. So now let's say that you have, you know, a 30 minute or a 15 minute video, but there's only really three core minutes of good footage. Is that the best asset that you can put out there on Facebook to have this very, very long video with just a little bit snippet of information in the middle? Probably not. You know, make sure you save your live videos and then go and recut those and turn them into, you know, an asset that you can put on social or something that's, uh, you know, evergreen that lives on one of your pages. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. Oh. You're ready? <laughs> Um, so I actually have two questions. Okay. Um, the first one is in the list of where you're saying to share video, share content. Uh, I noticed you didn't put the website. Like if someone has a website, do you putting those videos on the website? Yeah. Um, do you recommend that or no? And then my second question is whenever you're doing the data analytics, how long do you give before you decide this isn't working, we need to change something else? Is two weeks, a month? 
So. Got it. Yeah. Um, you know, videos on websites are amazing. On pretty much every page on dub.com, we have a video. That's just something that we decided to do. Every page of our dashboard has an explanation YouTube video. Our homepage has one. Our features video, our features page has one. So, um, you know, we're, we're totally bullish on video on websites. It works like a champ. Keep them short, keep, keep them concise. You know, if, if you have someone, if you have their attention for, you know, X number of minutes, don't consume all of that having them watch a video. Get to the point and then, again, take them down that funnel. So thank you for calling me out on that. You're totally right. Um, number two is about um, data tracking and timeliness of data tracking. So, um, you know, when we look at data tracking, it really depends on the campaign. So the smaller the campaign, the shorter the, dis the, shorter the time length, um, that it will take us for actually go in and to look at data. So if we're doing a campaign to 10 high value prospects, we're gonna go that day. At the end of the day, maybe we send an email campaign out, we're gonna see what happened. And then we're gonna sort of get some learnings and then pivot based on that. Um, but if it's a larger campaign, maybe a larger email campaign or maybe a social thing, you know, I like to go in at least weekly to kind of see what's going on. Um, it's, it's difficult though, because you have to get learnings. You have to get a large enough sample size with enough impressions, enough clicks to, you know, A, have the data make sense, but then B, have um, the, the systems be able to sort of parse the data and then, then to provide recommendations. Because of course, Google has that, Facebook has that. So, you know, I say either daily, weekly, or monthly. Um, depending on the size of the campaign. Um, and then I think a quarterly, you know, full recap with full reports shared with the entire team is critical because that's where you're gonna say, hey, what are we gonna do next quarter? You know, so. I have to say that you guys are so much more engaging than the LA audience. It's, just, it's great, I mean, you guys are, you know, I love the questions, yeah. Uh, so I work mainly as a video content creator for a university but oh, a lot nice. of it isn't data driven. Okay. And so if we wanted to integrate that into our process, what would be some maybe introductory tools? Like we don't have a stack of anything, frankly. Got it, um, okay. So what would be some introductory things you would recommend to learn more about video traffic in particular? Well, first I'll ask you a question. So how do you decide to make a video? What makes you want to make that video? Um, there's usually a client need. Somebody within the college needs some buzz about something. Okay, got it. Um, Cool. So then what, what is the goal? Is it recruiting or is it? Uh, you know, it varies. Sometimes okay. it's a call to action to join a group or to volunteer. Sometimes we're just trying to get maybe a lecture or just get the word out about an, uh, an event. Okay, got it. So, you know, there's a couple of different types of videos that you can test for that. So you can simply A-B test the format. So format is the first thing, right? Um, there could be two completely different um, versions of it. One of them can be, you know, a selfie vlog style video where someone is capturing an event or something that's happening. Maybe they're holding the phone. You know, maybe it's something super casual, super personable. Um, but then the second one would be something that's more traditional, you know, corporate promo, you know, the larger shots, um, the, the, the sort of the wide shots with a lot of lifestyle stuff. Um, and then maybe even a third version, which is, you know, a hybrid of those two, right? So I think format is the first thing that you can A-B test. What, what is the data that you can actually look at to figure out which one is getting more engagement? Well, there's YouTube, which is great. It's free, right? So you can figure out, you can look in the analytics of YouTube, you can see what the watch time is because watch time is one of the most critical things on a YouTube video. What percentage of the video did people get through? And you can actually see where people kind of dropped off. And that's really important because that drop off is where people got bored or people lost trust or where people made a choice or they got distracted. So that those data points um, on the, the video sort of engagement side is really gonna help you as a creator to figure out the, the, the format um, that you should best pursue. Um, I think the other one is the length. You know, how long should the video be? I keep talking about short form content and long form content, right? There's no rules here. I mean, there's different lengths for every single campaign. No one can tell you that a 12 second video is gonna convert better than a 60 second one. It all depends on so many things, the audience and the, you know, the affinity components and the, the placements and the campaigns and so on and so forth. So, you know, when you go in and you create your video, say, I'm gonna actually go in and create, I'm gonna have four exports. I'm gonna do a six second, I'm gonna do a 12, I'm gonna do a 15 and I'm gonna do a 30 and maybe even a two minute one. That's like a follow-up thing after the person fills out the form or something, right? So, you know, length is another thing that you can A-B test. Um, I think another thing is the, the ratio, right? So we, 
16.9 traditional letterbox. It's been around forever. Um, that's a 16.9 screen. That's what everyone's doing. Guess what? When you have a square or a 9 by 16 video, you occupy almost basically 2x the space. So if your video is like this on Facebook, when someone is scrolling, they're not seeing the distraction below your video. Do you realize that? It's kind of interesting. I mean, they're just focused on your video. It gives you about an inch or two of more real estate. That's very valuable, especially if you're putting dollars behind that video. So a lot of people might say, I hear this all the time. A lot of people say, well, we don't have the money to export different versions of our video in nine by 16. And I say, okay, fine. You're going to go spend that money and you're going to give it to Facebook and you're going to give it to, you know, Inst Instagram, Facebook, and you're going to give it to, um, does Google, no, Google doesn't have nine by 16. Um, Twitter, Twitter has some variations, which people should look into. But the point is, is that you can spend the money on the export, on the production, or you can spend it in the advertising. I say, you know, get your multiple assets so that you can A-B test as early on as possible. Um, so th there's, those are just a couple of points for you. Yeah. Any sort of final, final question as we wrap? I think we have about three minutes. Yeah. We got two. Um, this is actually two simple questions. One, you said that for uh, email marketing, you should turn it into an automated GIF. How, oh, animated you, GIF, yeah. yeah uh -huh. how, how do you do that? Have okay, you, so I'll, I'll give you, this is a blitz, I'll give you two methods right now. Okay, you have a video on YouTube, you go to giphy.com. How do you spell that? G-I-P-H-Y. G-I-P-H-Y. Yeah, you input the URL of the YouTube video. And then there's an automatic um, generator. So you can oh, kind of, great. you know, sort of on the timeline, figure out exactly um, what clip you want to export. And then just export that. You can throw a little graphic on there if you want. Um, side note, when you do put images on Giphy and you tag them with your URL or your name, you're, you're putting content out there on the internet. Giphy is, is a search engine. Giphy is all over. We all have it on our Google and, and Apple phones, right? So one of the things that sometimes when we do is when we have a YouTube video, we'll throw it up on Giphy, we'll parse it into little bits and pieces and have tiny little animated GIFs um, that is on Giphy that is searchable. So if someone types in video marketing, maybe it'll be a picture of me you know, dancing like a robot, you know, and that'll be the Giphy. So it's just a little bit of a little content source there. So the second one is a site called easygif.com, which is the ugliest website you'll ever see. We use it a lot. It was built 10 years ago, but it works very well. Easy GIF. Um, and then you upload your MP4, MOV, AVI, and then go through the whole process. You can crop, you can um, and so on and so forth. So just make sure that it's less than two megs. That's what we recommend. Two megabytes. Less, make sure that your animated GIF is less than two megabytes. If it's more than that, it's going to take forever to load in the person's email. Bad practice. Right. And then the other thing was for, you said for Facebook, it should be like six to 15 seconds. So do you just kind of reformat your video so it's short? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the smartest I, I think the smartest thing to do in the creation process is to know what your exportable lengths are going to be, right? And, and actually also your ratio size, because when you do that, then you can capture the right amount of content in the right amount of time. So, um, you know, when I said that, you know, 615 work on Facebook, again, you got to test everything. You know, two minute videos are still working in some cases if they're good stories. Um, but you know, it's an attention deficit issue. So, um, I would say, you know, go in knowing that you're going to create a short video, be concise. It actually really helps the creative process when you have that constraint, you know, when you're writing a script or you're going through something, having constraints as creative people actually empowers us because if we say we need to do a video within 12 seconds, it becomes easier, not more difficult. So, yeah. Um, I'll just wrap if there's a final question. You guys, thank you so much for your, oh, we got a final one. Hi, so we actually do a lot of video advertising on social platforms, on YouTube, and we drive a lot of traffic to our website, but I was just wondering in your opinion, should you be creating custom landing pages for the videos you're creating that also include the video itself and then just a call to action on that page? Or do you do a mix of both? I'm so passionate about that question. I wish I had 10 minutes to answer this. Um, 
I'll tell you everything I know in 60 seconds. Okay, landing pages are so critical for the video, it's not even funny. You know, you can't just put a video on some, some random um, landing page or your homepage and expect for it to convert. Why? Because it's an attention problem. When you're sending someone down to a website, you're sending them down a funnel. You've got, you know, X number of minutes to have them learn, build trust, you know, feel some sort of empathy, understand that there's some value proposition, something that can help them in, in their lives, and then the inspiration to convert. That's a lot of tasks, right? So um, your custom landing page is so critical for doing that. I believe in this so much that we actually spent months building out a whole landing page system specific for videos. It's a thing on dub, but we put a lot of data into it. We put a lot of effort because we realized that when people just slapped up a video on a random landing page, it didn't convert as well as a specific one for the video. So typically, the ones that we like that work the best for us, it's a, it's a hero message, it's a video, um, it's a call to action, it's a little bit more of an explanation, it's social proof, which is like logos, um, you know, trust badges, and then contact information, and then sub navigation links. That's the thing that works for us, so try, try it out for yourself. Um, you know, email me and let me know uh, what you came up with. You know, um, listen, you guys, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this. Um, I you, wish you best of luck on your efforts within video marketing. Um, please connect with me. We have a daily YouTube show called um, The Daily Dub. Check it out. It's kind of fun. And uh, there's my email and there's my, uh, my, my name. They're my, uh, what's it called? Username. Thank you. Thank you.